LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host, Greg Moffat, and my guest today is Eric Davis, who joins us to discuss his book, High Weirdness, Drugs, Esoterica, and Visionary Experience in the 70s. A study of the spiritual provocations to be found in the work of Terence McKenna, Robert Anton Wilson, and Philip K. Dick, High Weirdness charts the emergence of a new psychedelic spirituality that arose from the American counterculture of the 1970s. These three authors changed the way millions of readers thought, dreamed, and experienced reality. But how did their writings reflect, as well as shape, the seismic cultural shifts taking place in America? In High Weirdness, Davis, America's leading scholar of high strangeness, examines the published and unpublished writings of these vital, iconoclastic thinkers, as well as their own life-changing mystical experiences. He explores the complex lattice of the strange that flowed through America's west coast at a time of radical technological, political and social upheaval to present a new theory of the weird as a viable mode for a renewed engagement with reality. We ask, what is real? What is normal? What are facts? What is truth? And find that reality is unstable and that the world is considerably more malleable than it at first appears. Hello and welcome, Eric, and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Happy to be here. Today, Eric, we're going to be discussing your latest book, and it's a monster. It's entitled High Weirdness, Drugs, Esoterica, and Visionary Experience in the 70s. Before we dive into that, uh, tell listeners a little bit about your background and your work in general. Sure. Uh, I've been uh, a, a writer, freelance writer, a podcaster, journalist and author for, well, I guess the last uh, 30, 30 years. Um, uh, somewhere along the way, not too long ago, I got a PhD, so I have that going for me as well, but I don't currently work in academia, though I do like to uh, keep keep abreast of, of scholarly uh, discussions, particularly about weird topics. And uh, my, my book, High Weirdness, reflects some of that. It's based on my dissertation, um, so it's kind of a, a, a mutant beast. One part of it is a scholarly investigation of psychedelic experience and the uh, uh, fringe culture of the 1970s. Uh, and, but another part of it is a, a more uh, journalistic and engaging kind of lyrical exploration uh, of these topics as, as well. And that, that kind of reflects my interesting career, which has always sort of had one foot in something like scholarship, albeit underground scholarship in a lot of cases, and the other foot in a more kind of journalistic, uh, writerly uh, approach to matters. But uh, yeah, I've been on this beat for a number of decades now, and uh, it keeps being interesting. Well, in my recorded introduction, I set out the basic synopsis of the book and the, the three writers, thinkers, psychonauts uh, that uh, the book hinges on. But perhaps we could open by just saying something in general, about this the time period that the book encapsulates people, places, events. I don't know if this is from your book or not, but in my, in my notes I've got scribbled that things were happening, they were moving, people were being drawn to things, I mean, drawn to other people, uh, networks were being built. It was uh, quite quite a productive zeitgeist at the time. And I think this is a quote from your book that you said there were, quote, unquote, larger patterns of foot. So, I mean, as someone who was a small child at the time, I've been able to go back 
and mine that period of time and so much culture of all sorts and, and thinking and ideas that came from that period, which in many ways were quite downbeat. You know, the, the US, for example, and the UK were not really in a good place in the early 70s. But that's such an important period of time to me, in my case, in hindsight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, a similar thing. I mean, I was, I was very young in the, in the 70s. I mean, I, I guess I turned 13 in 1980. Uh, so I, it was really a, for me, a time of, of, of my adolescence. And, uh, but I picked up a lot on it, like a, a lot of the, some important cultural artifacts. And I mean, I remember I, in, in the, in the United States, I was obsessed with the bicentennial. I was obsessed with Watergate. Even though I didn't understand it, I was just a kid, but like, I knew that like Nixon was kind of this evil monster. And, you know, it was like, it, it was a very, when I think back at uh, my first political memory is of Watergate. My first memory of that there was a kind of a larger world than my hometown that it involved like the president and the war and, and malfeasance. And that was sort of my first impression of, of political reality, which has of course warped me, uh, ever since. But it was also kind of like reading Lord of the Rings or something, you know, it was like this sort of mythological battle. And so for me, the seventies, I can't, can't help but have a sort of a really evocative character because I associated with these, these sort of um, very young impressions uh, in my own mind. And then, as I also like to say, you know, people of our generation growing up in the 70s, you know, we started to feed the first sort of culture that we started to consume. A lot of it was made by heads, you know, so, you know, comic books and movies and TV shows, like a lot of it, there was like drug humor and it was made by people who had sort of gone through and been transformed by the 60s. So we had a sort of one step removed kind of relationship to a lot of uh, things that came out of the out of the counterculture. But as you say, it was also definitely a downbeat time, uh, certainly politically. Um, a lot of people were kind of existentially lost. They were blown open by the 1960s uh, when a lot of people expected a radical revolution to happen, either a revolution in consciousness or a revolution in the political structure. And they, that didn't happen. Oopsie. And now what do we do? So you have a lot of searching and seeking which is why the 70s is also a, a, the point of this tremendous explosion of creative, religious and spiritual and psychological exploration and new groups, new cults, new fads, new practices, um, the human potential movement, the rise in gurus, uh, uh, the emergence of the kind of uh, the, the, what would become the new age uh, by in the 1980s. All of that happens in the 1970s. So it's a very fertile, creative time, as well as a somewhat uh, desperate time. And I th it's, it's sort of a combination of both of those things. And I don't think you can understand the, the sort of high weirdness that I'm talking about, the, the psychedelic spirituality, the, uh, the sort of visionary intensities that I talk about. If you don't recognize that kind of both things are going on, it's a creative and, and visionary time in a lot of ways, people developing new lifestyles, embracing new new ways of being human, and at the same time was driven by a kind of sense of dread, political dread, and wor worries about the environment, worries about terrorism, uh, very real worries. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, the, the darkness that a lot of us feel today in the news, in, in the global situation, in politics, uh, it, it finds its, its uh, most resonant kind of analog, I believe, in the 1970s. When I was reading your book, someone spotted me and took interest in the cover and the size of it, and they basically said, what's that about? And I said, well, it's a little bit difficult to sum up, but, and again, this might be a quote from the book, I said, essentially, the world is considerably more malleable than it, f it at first appears. Perhaps you could give us, in the light of that, you could give us an overview of the characters that we're talking about here and they're basically how they first entered your life uh sure i mean i i would say that that uh the book is at its core an investigation into the extraordinary experiences of three visionaries who experience you know underwent their experiences in the 1970s and then later wrote about them so i'm writing about weird experiences, but also about the weird books that these people wrote about their weird experiences. Uh, and so that's the, the kind of core 
the core of the book are the is are are these studies of these three guys or four guys because the first one, Terrence McKenna, is really also about his brother Dennis, uh, who went down to Columbia in the early 1970s, 1971, and uh, had an extraordinary psychedelic experience uh, based on their their own researchers and their own weird ideas. Um, and these experiences really motivated the rest of their lives. And of course, Terrence later became a very well-known, uh, psychedelic monologuist and, uh, a thinker and, um, sort of star celebrity, if you will, of the underground. Um, and his whole rap was motivated by these extraordinary experiences in Colombia, uh, and later on in California where, where he lived. Um, and then the next up is, uh, Robert Anton Wilson, who, uh, was an older guy, wasn't a member of the, of the baby boomers the way Terrence was, um, but also was a very significant counterculture intellectual. He wrote a famous book with a friend called Illuminatus that was published in 1975 that really captures the sort of conspiratorial, esoteric, playful, prankster, satirical side of the counterculture uh, in a remarkable way. But he, too, had a ex- very extraordinary experience um, or set of experiences in the 1970s when he was living in Berkeley and experiences that he later wrote about. Uh, and like with Terrence um, and with Philip K. Dick, who's the number three in the, in the group, uh, these experiences are extraordinary because from some perspectives, they look like religious experiences or mystical experiences. But from other perspectives, they look like psychotic experiences. And from still other viewpoints, they look like science fiction stories or occult fables or weird fiction. And the fact that they have this character that they kind of look differently depending on how you, how you, how you uh, approach them is part of what I mean by high weirdness. There's a sort of loss of of a clear category of what we're talking about here, uh, and that very ambiguity is part of what high weirdness is about. It's part of what the the 70s are about, in my opinion, uh, and it's part about it, it partly explains why I approach them the way I do, which is to use a lot of different tools, you know, to develop a lot of complicated, not complicated, but, but, uh, you know, uh, acute tools to be able to go in there and try to analyze what are we talking about here? How do we think about these extraordinary experiences? How do we take them, as I say in the book, seriously without taking them literally? Uh, and I think that's a really important, uh, kind of injunction to keep in mind whenever we're talking about weird experiences. Um, is to not just write them off as craziness or uh, some kind of excess or something, but also not to be wary of taking them too literally or taking them too much on their own terms, because clearly sometimes those terms are really <laughs> bizarre and uh, and sometimes a bit delusional. Well, we don't deal with ambiguity very well as a species generally, do we? We like to dissect and categorize things scientifically and that's obviously why the work of these individuals and their experiences pres- are, are so troubling to so many people but when you're talking about the experiences to take them seriously but not literally cuts to another thread i think that runs throughout the book which is the question of like what is real what is reality because these uh men's experiences are prompt us to ask that but also you know in their writings they're asking that as well in their own work they're asking that in many ways and it reminds me also of something I've often thought about dreams, which, you know, I remember one having a nightmare once as a child and a mother saying, oh, you don't, you know, dream, that's not real. But all I could think at the time was, well, hang on a minute, it happened to me. It, it really disturbed me. So in what sense was it not real? Yeah. I mean, the, the question of, uh, of reality is a, is a tricky one. You know, you can get lost in the weeds. It's very controversial. Um, as soon as you start suggesting that Reality might be a little bit more complicated and ambiguous and uh, even uh, uh, slippery and magical than it necessarily asse- uh, uh, seems on the surface. Um, you know, then you immediately have to start arguing with uh, with scientists or science scientism minded people 
who, although I believe, and this is one of the uh, things I try to do in my book, is to present a way of thinking about unusual experiences, anomalous experiences, over-the-top visionary experiences that, again, take them seriously, give them a certain, you know, uh, respect, respect them in, in a lot of ways, and at the same time, uh, presenting them in ways that shouldn't uh, overly challenge uh, an open-minded materialist. You know, I'm not interested in insisting on that, you know, science is wrong or it's complete, it's incomplete or that it doesn't understand consciousness or that there's a quantum reality or that there's other planes of existence or that, you know, uh, spiritual beings are real or, you know, I'm not really interested in those things. I mean, they're, they're important ideas. I think we should all wrestle with things like that. Um, but I'm more interested in trying to, to stay close to a somewhat conventional understanding of reality, but kind of point to the places where it's not quite as coherent as we might like to think it is, uh, to insist that even a rigorous, grounded, materially informed approach to understanding reality, if it's being honest with itself, has to recognize that there are profound ambiguities, ambivalences, marginal weirdnesses, uh, anomalies, paradoxes, enigmas, mysteries, that those things cannot be banished simply by assuming that the confidence of scientists around certain particular questions and particular domains of expertise means that we're, we're done with uh, the, the, the more mysterious parts um, of reality. That said, I think that part of what makes reality 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 is that it's elusive that it it doesn't quite show up in our representations that it undermines our attempts to understand it as much as it uh, f even more than it fulfills them so to be in relationship with the real is always a kind of tricky game where you're you're kind of having to undermine your own assumptions as much as open up to evidence and open up to you know, thinking philosophically or thinking rationally about the implications of certain things. So I try to kind of walk a middle way uh, in that stuff. And it, I think, you know, I, I, I like to think I do a, a decent job of it, but it's not going uh, to be to everyone's taste. Well, as you say in the book, um, anomaly is a characteristic of the real. So that th th these sort of th the high weirdness in a way, is within reality. So, so like, uh, for example, if you look at some of the propositions of quantum physics, people are sort of saying, well, that, you know, that, that defies the laws of, of physics. You know, it's, it's outside of science. It's not. I would say we should just expand science, expand physics, expand whatever it is to take account of these things. We've gone through thousands of years of increasing our understanding of the world around us and taking different approaches to it. And yet anomalies keep popping up. And I almost think that it feels at the minute that that's almost increasing. And in a way, it's kind of like, well, this is a disembodied voice asking this question. Okay, you're getting better. That is in you, me, and, and everyone else. You're getting better at solving these things. You know, science and other methodologies are giving you increasing understanding of the reality around you. So I'm going to give you more, a little bit like a student. You know, okay, so you're learning a language. You're getting better at it. So I'm going to give you more homework. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I think I think so. I mean, one of the 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 goals that I uh, of of my book um, that I like to think I I succeeded at was that I wanted to bring in a number of difficult ideas, not to not to needlessly complicate any, the situation, but because I think we need we need to really think in order to approach. Uh, these experiences, ideas about these experiences, how to think about these experiences. We need to not just rest on the usual patterns or languages that we, we use to approach them. So that means we got, I got to bring in some new material, but I, I made a kind of vow that if I was going to bring in scholarly discussions, philosophical ideas, um, uh, complicated ways of maybe linking different discourses, you know, maybe scientific over here and cultural over here, over there. If I was going to do that stuff, I was going to have to be very clear ab about about it, try to write it in an accessible way, try to write it in a inviting way to, to basically say to the reader, look, it's worth it 
to spend the time to absorb this stuff because it's going to make what comes next much more of a mind blower. It's going to be more fun. So it's a, it's this kind of balance between like, um, education and entertainment <laughs> that I, I, that, you know, at least for a certain kind of reader, people who are kind of up for it and who like, who enjoy ambiguity and, and moving between things and not necessarily knowing exactly where we're headed. Um, I think it's really a, a rewarding thing, but also a, a learning experience. Well, I think you, your closing comments there really, I, I couldn't agree more with. I think that one of the sources of our, our suffering, you know, is uh, the struggle to have all the answers and just say that's the data's in now. Uh, we can close the file on that one. If you see what I mean, like a detective trying to solve a case. I think if we can tolerate at least a certain degree of ambiguity, life becomes a lot more interesting, a lot more fun, a lot less painful. Even death doesn't seem so intimidating anymore. Well, it's a, it's an interesting issue. I mean, what you just said is very much my experience that that in the, the the greater you can embrace ambiguity, and that doesn't mean just throwing up your hands and going, oh, it's all a mystery, who knows? It means being willing to tolerate paradox, enigma, to not necess- to, to when confronted with something that is shadowy, to not immediately reach for a clear-eyed solution, but to be able to kind of rest and move through uh, the ambiguity that the you know, for me, as for you, it's it's a it improves life, improves thinking, uh, it increases your ability to appreciate existence, enjoy it, and also to uh, engage things like death that are you know overwhelmingly challenging, uh, and and that it really gives you a kind of leg up. But that you know, as you said earlier, that's not the way most people approach it. Uh, and that even though I, it seems very obvious to me that existence is filled with ambiguities, um, there's a real push within in- individuals, psych- psychologically, uh, ideologically, politically, to have certainty. And that certainty gives you a kind of bulwark against the chaos. It gives you a, you know, a, a kind of clear sense of like who you are and what your boundaries are and what's good and what's bad. And yeah, sure, that could, that can be really helpful. And in some ways we have to be certain, you know, I, there are certain ethical principles I think we have to hold on to and not just throw ambiguity over every aspect of our existence. But I really believe that opening up to ambiguity, which is partly the work of the intellect, but also partly the work of the heart and the work of, of personal experience and exploration. Uh, that when we do that, we're not only, we, out, we not only grow more comfortable with the way reality actually is, uh, but we're able to see more and to understand more and even more be able to connect with a wider range of perspectives because we're willing to tolerate the fact that there's contradictions. That if, you know, I, I'm very, I love science and yet there are some things I'm interested in that most people who are, you know, pro science or consider themselves to be scientists want to have nothing to do with like what astrology or quantum uh what like jumping from quantum physics to mysticism is not what i'm talking about it's more the way that there are these different domains and they have their own rules and they relate in some ways and in other ways they don't relate and so to be able to move between them requires a a, a high tolerance for for ambiguity and just to address something that you touched upon there, ambiguity, yes, but you're right. It's not not a baby and bathwater situation. For example, in the case of good and evil, right and wrong, I think unless you know you're a psychopath, I think we instinctively understand those things. So yes, as you say, not just put everything into a big ambiguity soup and say that nothing can be known. That's not the case. For me, it's just I feel that we don't have a fixed state reality, whether it's evolution moving things on whether it's the universe expanding, whether it's quantum particles popping in and out of existence. I just think that reality is a process and we, because our, partly because we, we have short, such short lives that we tend to see it as, as, as fixed somehow. Yeah, I think that's, that's probably true. And, and I, I often just wonder what, is it just a temperamental thing that, that people grow up enjoying ambiguity or they, they see ambiguity thrust upon them and so they learn to enjoy it. I mean, sometimes that's how I feel about it. Uh, uh, it's not always so pleasant. You know, sometimes it's very painful to be 
unresolved or to recognize the complexity of something. Um, and, you know, I can look even longingly sometimes at people who are very certain about lots of things because it seems like they have a, a kind of clarity and drive that I sometimes don't have because I'm always looking for the other side. Um, and I, but I wonder is that, is that something that we're just born with? You know, is it, is it a temperamental thing? Is it, is it something that changes as we have certain kinds of experiences? Um, you know, if we're, if we, if we plunge, you know, even like meditation for me is very much a practice of, 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 I'm a long time meditator of entering into and embracing a certain kind of ambiguity about what's real, who, what, what is the mind? Who am I? What is death? And yet it's very clear to me that there are also practitioners who have put decades into their life and they're very certain. They're very certain about their perspective, about the B- Buddhist view or the Hindu view or the Christian view. And they're, and they're pretty, uh, pretty insistent about it. So it's, it doesn't necessarily go along with any particular practice, it seems to me, this tolerance or even enjoyment, uh, uh of ambiguity versus a kind of, um, need or, or a drive to, to be clear and to hold on to certainties. Well, I think you could, it's fine to be certain about something until you're not, if you see what I mean. So it's just that if something new comes along, it's being open to new information. One of the things I love about, I, and I write and talk a lot about, a great deal about this, and it comes up right throughout your book, and you, you speak of it as the, the play of as if. And again, to quote from the book, in encounters with high weirdness, culture becomes consciousness. And this is the idea that Illuminatus, Robert Anton Wilson's book, is a perfect example how um, these fictions can actually then, it's like life imitating art, isn't it? They can spill out into what we consider to be actual reality in kind of very unpredictable and, and mysterious and surprising and profound ways sometimes. Yeah, I mean that's that's one of the core themes in the book is the 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 peculiar liveliness of fictions. And it's really a huge issue, you know, you can talk about today like when we we worry about how uh conspiracy theory is influencing mainstream political discourse even consensus reality in some ways. One way to talk about that is that these fictions are have been let out of the uh <laughs> you know the the, uh, the 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 zoo of fiction and are now running amok in a so-called reality um and uh, that's just one example of how fictions can become very lively and influence um the sort of non-fictional reality we might hold to but a deeper point is that fictions are are woven into reality they're woven into our experience our thoughts uh our attitudes the stories we tell um, which is not to say that things like science are just fictions. It's much more complicated than that. And that's why I think you have to, you have to step carefully when you, when you go into these realms and, and, uh, you know, against the, the, the sort of, uh, tendency to just throw up your hands or to just go, Oh, it's all fiction or whatever, which I don't believe. Um, but what's interesting about the seventies and, and the experiences of, of these three guys and the books they wrote is it's a time when you really see uh, that people start to recognize that things that once were thought of as religious truths or dogma or, um, necessary realities, um, are maybe just like fictions, but that they still have a certain kind of power. Um, that's very much a theme in, say, Robert Anton Wilson's work, where he's pl- actively playing with the breakdown of reality and fantasy, uh, and he's sort of letting loose these fictions and showing how they percolate through people's lives and end up impacting and shaping their experience. And, you know, we can see all this for, for good and certainly for ill, probably more, for, more for ill than for good, uh, today. Um, that doesn't mean it's not true. You know, in some ways, the whole history of religion is a history of living fictions. And that, and I say that not to just denigrate them. Oh, those are just stories. They're just fictions. That's not what I mean. I mean that the, the, the 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 fiction making creative imagination our story telling capacity the way in which we experience reality itself as a kind of symbolic space a place of meaning a place of of speaking a place of storytelling that that pa- facet of of hu- human being is inextricable from our sense uh, of reality and while that means we need to be critical of the stories that are guiding us and critical of the fictions that inhabit uh, the real we can't really escape them 
Uh, and in some cases, people even sort of can begin playing with them, sort of play with the way that fiction can sort of shape your life through the as if. Let's act, you know, like there's a, a an exercise in, in Buddhism, or at least in the a Buddhism that I learned, where people were like, well, go through the day and imagine that everybody you encounter is a Buddha in disguise. And it's really interesting because it's not like you actually think that that, you know, whatever, 14-year-old annoying skateboarder on the on the bus <laughs> is a Buddha in disguise. But if you get yourself into that as-if space, you know, your experience of the world really changes, not just your own heart, but your sense of, like, what's going on can really powerfully shift. And so, well, that's a, a fiction and as-if assumption, but it's one that really transforms your immediate experience and even your sense of what's going on here. You know, you might be closer to the experience of like, wow, even though I don't really get along with some of these people, I can see the way that they're all, you know, they're all trying to do what they think is right or they're all trying to, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, be happy in their reality as opposed to just seeing them as enemies or as fools. Uh, and, and so then you start to actually shift your kind of experience. I mean, in a way, that's sort of a, a, a trivial example. Um, but a, another way of talking about it is what happens when people are doing, um, religious rituals or occult rituals, when they're calling on gods, when they're using their creative imaginations to imagine, uh, different scenarios, imagine different, um, spirits or entities. And it's, in a lot of ways, it's, it, this is the fiction, weaving part of our imaginations and yet when you supercharge that in a in a kind of religious or ritual setting those things can become quite lively and indeed i think that's part of what you see in the history of the occult and a lot of occultists will admit this particularly more contemporary occultists you know chaos magicians or people who you know work with uh, lovecraft gods or whatever where there that you can even use explicit fictions inside of your ritual practices and achieve some kinds of results or that, that drive towards the kinds of things you want. So, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of dimensions to it, but the, the as if is a very, very powerful operator that we have to use and we have to use it even in science. You know, that there's a certain way that the as if is, is related to sort of hypotheses like, well, let's hypothesize that this is the case. If that's true, then let's see what the consequences are. You know, is there really a law of gravity? A law of gravity? Is it a habit? Where, how do we put, where do we put that law? But in some ways, it's better to act as if there is a law of gravity. It makes other things, other operations, other uh, experiments make more sense. So it's the as if isn't just about sort of mere fictions. It's, it's really an operator that we use in relationship to to reality and how we think about reality. Well, as if is one of the cornerstones of uh, new thought, uh, known in some circles basically as positive thinking. You know, I'm going to go through the day as if uh, my wishes have been granted. You know, if, if you want to be a rock star, you've got to act like one. Uh, you know, living, uh, you know, as if your wishes have been granted. And I did a, a recent two-part show with Thomas Sheridan called uh, Haunted Pasts and Lost Futures, and this was about hauntology. And in that, we talked about how a lot of the pop culture, the, the weird, high weird pop culture that we absorbed actually influenced our lives. It changed the course of our lives. You see that a lot today, people doing this perhaps unconsciously. I'm not just talking about cosplay and, you know, Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings or whatever. In a sense of, you mentioned Lovecraft a moment ago, and in the book you talk about, there's some, particularly with Philip K. Dick, how some of his stories have that Lovecraftian quality that you kind of think you're immersed in it and it's becoming real in your mind because, yeah, this isn't just, oh my God, this is, hor this is horrifying. He's talking about this and he's like, it's just a, a fiction. But you, you see um, how that can have real effects in the real world, depending on how people interpret things or how they, how they act afterwards. So it, that's, has parallels with what you said about you going through the day considering everyone to be a Buddha. It's just, it changes your behavior. It's that then, that's a real thing. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely, that's absolutely true. And I do think that one of the reasons to pay attention to, uh, weird fictions like Lovecraft and, and in this case, Philip K. Dick, because I agree with you that, that some of his stories have that, 
that characteristic. And certainly Robert Anton Wilson's stuff does. Illuminatus has elements of that. And of course, they were all sort of influenced by all three of these guys were influenced by Lovecraft to some degree. But the point is not to because it's horror, there's horror monsters or whatever. It's just that with that work, you can see more clearly how these fictions start to generate a more than fictional reality. You can see how, you know, Lovecraft invited other people to start telling Lovecraftian stories. So there starts to be a shared mythos between multiple uh, artists. So that already is a, is a clue that, that contemporary cosplay and RPG f- fans realize is that if we come together collectively and agree on a shared imaginal universe, it starts to gain a certain density that it didn't have when it was just ourselves or even ourselves reading a book or something there's something about the active collective use of a mythology that 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 you know makes it start to ha- gains a little bit of density um and i think that 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 factor is part of what people do when they when they use uh positive thinking And which is, you know, it's a tricky thing. Like, how far can you take it? I mean, some people clearly take it so far that they they believe that if you're if you're experiencing difficulties in your life, that's because you didn't think about them properly. You know, and that's the really harsh uh, kind of nasty judgmental side of, of positive thinking is that if you use it as a totalizing philosophy, if you really think this is just the way reality is in total, that it's about what our uh, assumptions are, what our thoughts are, and if we therefore think better, then disease will disappear and all that kind of stuff. That's clearly not helpful. That's clearly delusional. But the flip side uh, is not to therefore dispense with anything like positive thinking. I think we still have to take responsibility for the stories we tell ourselves because clearly those stories do make a difference. They, they at the very least, uh, open up and shut down opportunity, our perceptual opportunity. So if you're in a miserable, depressed state and you're ruminating on the same thing over and over again and you walk down the street, you're walking down a different street than if you have an, uh, you know, an open mind, you're ready for magic, you're ready for synchronicity, uh, you're engaged in possibility. The street you walk down is a richer street. There's just more going on. There's more possibilities. So it's it, it, it that will directly influence your um, sense of reality. Now, in some ways, I think actually having uh, uh, some a, a somber view can let you see more clearly what opportunities are really there. Whereas, uh, uh, you know, someone who's just addicted to being uh, positive minded and, you know, you see this a lot in California being chipper and open to it all can get lost more easily in delusion and in unproductive, um, you know, foolishnesses. So it's not like one is good and one is bad and that positive thinking is good and and, uh, thinking critically or even pessimistically is always bad. It's just that there's, we have to take responsibility and be aware of what the stories are uh, that, that we're, that we're involving. And, you know, even uh, Robert Anton Wilson, who was, you know, in some ways, very critical guy, not a standard new ager by any stretch of the imagination, but he also experimented with uh, positive thinking and and um, and those kinds of affirmations and, uh, and and stuff like that. Because it, all of those things are, really do make a difference. We are very plastic creatures. Our sense of reality, our interpretations of reality, are plastic, but reality itself is able to be molded uh, in relationship with us and, and sometimes not with us in, in all manner of ways. And, uh, again, I think that one outcome of this is, is, is just to take responsibility and be aware as much as you can for the stories that you are telling or that you are drawn to, or that you are repeating, uh, in your work. And as you move through the world, the comment you just made, plus your comment about California, I'd reply to that, that mindless, Optimism is just as damaging potentially as mindless pessimism. The key, you know, the common word there being mindless. That, that's certainly the case. Uh, but I liked what you said about walking down a different street. Yes, that's a really, really key point. I think in that sense, uh, a lot of people think that, you know, objectively we all live in the same world, but I don't, I feel anyway, I, I probably don't even live in exactly the same world as you. Your, your world's a little bit different to mine, uh, and some other people's worlds are uh, radically different from mine and it is about your perception and what how you process that 
Um, in terms of um, what we spoke about earlier about, you know, uh, people being obsessed with a certain subculture, well, look at Klingon being developed into a full-blown language, you know, from Star Trek. Look at the number of people who are putting Jedi down as their religion on their census form. If that's not um, fiction manifesting itself in, you know, in what 3D reality that a lot of us take to be all that there is, then I don't know what else is. Yeah, those are those are perfect examples. I mean, in a lot of ways, those those examples, uh, you know, go back to the seventies because in a in a way, while people have been doing you know things like that in earlier times, to my mind, uh, you know, as a historian, cultural historian, it's really in the the the, the late sixties and in the seventies that you that you see people start to really intensely create. Um, these modes out of fictional universes that take on this, this extra quality. So you see like the, the growth of a, of Lord of the Rings fandom where people are not just content to read the books, but they want to live in the books. And so they want to explore their languages and develop it or, or, you know, develop, uh, uh, you know, religions that have some characteristic that's related to, uh, you know, the, 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 the world of, um, Middle Earth. And, and, you know, so that we're, that's where we can trace those things today through Jedi religion and, and other sorts of parody or invented religions that, um, that people are, are, pl- are continue to play with today. A phrase you used a few moments ago and caught my attention, which was, uh, that some of these, um, uh, subculture groups were agreeing on a shared imaginal universe. And I think that the mainstream or consensus portion of humanity, I think that's what we're doing at any given time. And it explains why some of our ancestors saw the world so differently. And the world as we see it now, it may or may not be closer to some kind of, if there is a fundamental material reality, which I do question, but if there is, we might be closer to it than we've ever been. But in any event, the shared uh, imaginal universe is what we as a species are agreeing on at any given time. And I think when that is being undermined or is shifting, remembering what I said earlier about reality not being fixed, uh, that, that can be very disturbing to us. And I think that general idea comes up again and again in your book when you're writing about the McKenna's and Philip K. Dick and uh, Robert Anton Wilson's their their work and their experiences. Yeah, very much. I mean, I I would think that that just to get back to our, you know earlier comment about about ambiguity, I think one thing that's that's a value in research like mine because I sometimes you know I put in so much effort, you know, years of work to study this stuff. It's like, what good does this really do? Isn't this just kind of crazy stuff? It it's in the margins. It, it's maybe it's only to, important to people who aren't who've already kind of checked out from you know the real reality and where the really important stuff is going on. And I'm like, no, 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 because these things. Studying these things, experiencing these things, um, thinking about them, tracking them, historicizing them. All of this is a way to develop a new skill that is, is able to take on, uh, again, ambiguity and reality, the multiplicity of viewpoints on what's going on. And that this, I, I like to think in any case, I believe, but I may be wrong, but I like to think it helps us navigate a time in history when uh, when consensus reality is fragmenting, it's melting down. You know, we can barely agree on the most obvious facts. Everything is kind of weaponized, polarized, um, attacked, uh, scare quoted, um, you know, translated into a different language that is, uh, you know, that some people like to use, uh, in very specific ways. And so we're, it, it's really a time when, when nuance and, um, complexity are being chased out of the game, even as the experience itself, the world itself is becoming more complex, at least technologically, politically, uh, uh, in terms of media, in terms of consciousness, really. I mean, not complex, like sophisticated complex, just like there's a lot going on. Uh, and I think that me- that that tends to to encourage people to hold on to simple stories because it's it's a safer place to be. But I don't think that's helpful now. In fact, I think it's very clear looking at 
at, let's say, social media and the way social media is changing politics and changing how people inhabit the world, how they think about their fellow citizens, how they think about uh, communication, how they think about people who don't agree with them, that in, in, in many ways this has been a terrible, terrible development. And uh, one of the ways it's been terrible is to just encourage people to be more certain less less open to ambiguity less open to the complexity and the and the subtlety and the nuance of reality and more insistent about their particular point of view and it's it's really a, a shit show i mean it's it's a it's a bad scene and so even though i'm not saying that like psychedelics are going to save the day or paranormal studies are going to save the day i'm just saying that one reason to pay attention to this stuff to spend some time with these enigmas and mysteries and allowing a sort of imaginal contact or even initiation to occur is a way to begin to open up to be able to tolerate more difference, more multiplicity, more complexity, more nuance, and not necessarily reach for an answer. Uh, and that that's a, a skill, uh, a, a, a spiritual quality, if you will, that carries on throughout our, all the domains of our life, even real nitty gritty ones. Yes. These anomalous experiences, this anomalous data is telling us something. There's a message there. It's not just noise in the system, as it were. Yeah, you're speaking here, you're alluding there to the, the contemporary situation, social, political, whatnot. We're at a point in time now when people are questioning what facts are. Well, you know, what is a fact? You know, what is the truth? What does it mean to say this is true? That's interesting ground to say the least. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how much more I have to say about these characters and the political situation in terms, in the terms that we've been talking about today. I mean, I think a lot of us are, are all too well aware of, uh, you know, the ways in which these themes that we've been talking about are, are being weaponized and, uh, just, you know, un are, are being used to undermine consensus undermine a uh, space of public discourse to allow certain forces to to rule and to essentially serve a certain very real kind of chaos uh, and disruption uh so i don't i'm not really sure how much additional light i can shed on that uh in terms of the politics of the thing but i would like to say some, a, a little bit about facts i i don't we don't have the time to go into the the deeper discussion about it but one thing that was really important for me to do in in the book is to to push back against the assumption that once you start talking the way we've been talking in this uh, conversation, once you start thinking this way, that you're saying that like, oh, there's nothing like a fact. All we have are stories. All we have are narratives. All we are, I'll have is some kind of artificial consensus that's built up through the media or through uh, institutional players. That sort of deep nihilism or relativism is something that you know more traditional thinkers will say oh that's just postmodern relativism it means every perspective is valid and therefore none of them are valid because there's nothing like a, a fact anymore i don't think that's true i don't think that's true at all and so one of the things i do in the book early on in the book is to say look what is you know what is a fact how can we describe a fact in a way that doesn't just make it seem like it's in it's a completely uh, immediate un qualified chunk of of capital r reality you know which is in a way is would be a, a a naive way of thinking about a fact but at the same time it's not just a story there's a difference between you know your 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 kid relating a nar a, a dream narrative they had from the night before and the law of gravity there, there's a fundamental difference there. It's not because the law of gravity doesn't isn't also a story or isn't also drawing from the human imagination. It does to a degree, but it also goes through a variety of processes, human processes, social processes, at the end of which a kind of s assumption or guess about something becomes a fact. And we might still disagree with it. We might say that the processes that went through to, to become a fact are faulty, you know, and, and we might disagree about how that happens. It's, it's not a route towards perfect agreement, but we still, I believe, and in the sense I'm kind of a quote unquote conservative, I guess, uh, in, in the old sense of the term, not politically, that we got to respect the processes through which facts are, are created. Doesn't mean they're absolute. Doesn't mean we can't 
uh, 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 investigate them further and maybe replace them if they're wrong. But the kind of distrust of science process, scientific processes, experimental processes, institutional processes that you see today, particularly in the conspiracy fringe world, uh, to my mind are, are really, uh, really, you know, deeply problematic because it's just like, oh, there's no facts. It's just a lie. NASA's lying to us. There's no moon launch. All that kind of approach, uh, I think is really, uh, deletory. So it's, so as I go into these weird, domains of conspiracies and occult powers and mind control and all this kind of crazy stuff, it's also really important for me to say, look, the the ways in which we construct facts are different than the ways we construct narratives or myths or uh, merely purely cultural objects. There's something different about that we should respect. Uh, and I, you know, I believe that. But, you know, in a way, that's a, a fuddy-duddy response at this point in the game because everybody's much more it's much more sexy and powerful to just completely denigrate the whole um the whole institution that has produced or the whole historical uh conversation that has produced the facts that you don't want to deal with facts about climate change or you know facts about the, the that the earth is round or whatever it is um uh, and and you know and in that sense I uh, I'm I'm really disheartened by uh, the way that a certain kind of postmodernism or a certain kind of relativism has infected the way people think about reality claims. Well, the extreme conspiratorial view of the world is really just another way of trying to say that we know what's going on. Uh, you know that you know they did it, and they're behind everything, whoever they are. It's sort of a degree of certainty from uncertainty in a way. Now, that sort of black and white thinking is just not particularly helpful. Uh, we'll talk very briefly about psychedelics as we're almost out of time. It is, however, a very important component of your book. These certainly feel like very meaningful experiences uh, to those who have them, and experiencers come away feeling that they have gained important information about the nature of reality. It's very difficult to express any of this to someone who has never had such an experience, but there certainly seems to be something very meaningful there. The experiences themselves can startle, amaze, bamboozle, confound, terrify, delight, all of these things and more. And they can be profoundly life-changing, as, you know, as, uh, as Terence McKenna in particular you know, was living proof of. Um, but like near-death experiences, as mentioned earlier, passage of time can melt the profoundness of these experiences away. But how, whether they change the experiencer's life or not, I think that they're ultimately part of a spectrum of phenomena trying to tell us something about the nature of reality. Essentially, that it's much wider and deeper than it at first appears to our five senses. You know, in a way, we earlier we talked about the power of positive thinking and the power of doing something like, in my example... Uh, going through your day with the frame in your head that everyone's a Buddha and how that changes your experience, how you learn from that. You learn more about people, you learn about yourself, you learn about how we, how our assumptions shape our experience of ordinary reality. It's a valuable game to play, to, to call it a game. I think there's a, there's another kind of game with psychedelics, which is to take, put on the framework that they have something to say. You know, they have something to say to us, whether at a certain time in history, a lot of people believe that there's a reason everyone's interested in psychedelics now, because it's, it's helping us guide us through this very, you know, difficult passage, maybe transformative passage. Um, but uh, even on an individual level, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm eating my mushrooms. What's my frame? What's my set? As they say in the classic psychedelic language of set and setting. What is my, what are my assumptions? or my stories about what I'm doing? Am I just perturbing molecules in my brain with other molecules? Am I um, experiencing a rewiring of my nervous system? Still pretty materialist way of thinking about it. Am I shaking up my cognitive universe, my symbols and stories about who I am and what the world is? I'm, I'm, and I'm kind of shaking the snow globe, as some people talk about. Or... Am I going to go a little bit farther and kind of have the idea, as 
many indigenous groups do, that there's actually a teaching spirit associated either with the plant or through the portals of the plant experience that I'm in touch with non-human teachers, in essence. And what I think is really interesting about that framework, the teaching framework, the psychedelics is a kind of learning framework, is that it works both if you are a kind of religiously minded or indigenously minded so that you're really attracted, let's say, to the idea that ayahuasca is a kind of teaching spirit that will reflect on things that you need in your life and will give you the visions that are appropriate for this point in your existence and and that 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 there's a sort of spirit a grandmother a grandfather through the compound that's going to uh to communicate with you that's a you know kind of religious way or mythological way of thinking uh about it but even if we're take a more secular approach a more critical minded approach that says, well, I don't really know what psychedelics are, but one thing we, like, I, I do think is that they are material molecules that are metabolized in my nervous system that produce certain kind of regular pat- uh, patterns and shifts in cognition, some of which can show up on a, you know, a, on a machine and some of which we can kind of cu- accumulate a model of a- anecdotally, uh, but that has these sort of features but it's still a teaching situation because I'm still learning how to navigate it. And I'm starting to learn that my ideas about it help navigate what it is. So that's sort of a really interesting kind of tricky point where the ideas I bring to the experience sh- actively shape the experience. So if I bring the idea that the situation is a teaching one, one where I'm learning, whether or not there quote unquote really is an entity that is teaching me, I have set in motion or a, a situation has been set in motion in which teaching and learning occur. And so I'm really interested in, 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 in a lot of ways in, in gaining the value from that more expanded view of possibility that you're not just perturbing molecules. You're not even just shaking up the uh, snow globe of my consciousness, but I'm actually learning from the universe, learning from my own experience in a way that nothing else can teach me, I can do that without uh, having to sign up to some new age or esoteric belief system. And I think that's really important. I think that that's really, really important because um, if if the only way these things are going to help really transform people and really open people up is by adopting some kind of um, you know, mythological set of ideas or some ideas about the true nature of the world or the nature of spiritual entities or all of that stuff, then I don't think we're going to get very far. I think it's, it's when we recognize that there, that these are teaching experiences, learning opportunities, um, across the board, uh, that hopefully some real, uh, a broader uh, positivity will, will come from this culture wide encounter. <clears throat> Um, I think it's in the Philip K. Dick section of your book, the third and final section, uh, where there's a, a reference to uh, the origins of Christianity and the consumption of uh, psychedelic mushrooms. But in any event, uh, we find a lot of evidence back into the past in probing uh, of connections between uh, religions and psychedelic experience, or at least some form of transcendent experience or altered states of consciousness. Uh, In these experiences, the psychedelic ones in particular, we do find common ground with psychedelic experience in general. So the sort of proto-religious psychedelic experience and just, uh, you know, an everyday trip. Common themes, uh, common imagery, uh, almost suggesting sort of autonomous realms. So things that independent experiencers report and things that that individuals have been able to go back and return to, again, almost like revisiting a place that exists autonomously. Uh, in terms of Im- imagery, you know, common themes, I mean, there are many of them, many, many of them. Clusters of eyes, corridors of fire, just eyes and fire in general. The experience of entities waiting for the psychonaut to arrive in this place you know, we've been waiting here for you. What took you so long? And also the experience of returning somewhere, as mentioned before. Ah, there they are again, you know, these um, entities. Welcome back, you know, we, we've been waiting for you. 
Yeah, and I think the final point I, I'd say here is this is a really good example to see the difference between taking things seriously and taking them literally. Is there's a very strong tendency, particularly in the kind of DMT world, uh, for people to take these experiences literally in the sense that we are in communication with beings from another dimension. And I want to, you know, underscore the, the, the phenomenological fact, at least for a lot of us. I don't know if it maybe is entirely a fact. Maybe it's an anecdotal, uh, truth that many, many people experience this. They've experienced it as far back as we can trace, uh, people using smoked DMT. And these are people who are not in a necessary, not growing up in a culture that believes in, you know, alien entities from other dimensions necessarily, even though that's in the comic books or the, or the, you know, the pop, the pop uh, movies. Um, but that that's a very strong feature of these experiences is the sense that they are realer than real, that you are now actually seeing something even more fundamentally true about reality and that involves m multiple dimensions that are inhabited with entities or intelligences that are not you, that are not human. Uh, so a lot of people take that literally. So yeah, let's, tr let's do it up. We're now in communication with uh, alien intelligences and uh, all you need to do is uh, hit the pipe, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other side, of course, is the typical reduction sides. Like you're just crazy. You're just like screwing around with your brain. It's just going haywire. You're misreading it, blah, blah, blah. And that's not very satisfying either. Uh, it's let even probably less satisfying, but what's, is there a middle way? And there actually is a middle way which is that we are seeing something really profound about the way in which we uh, construct reality, we experience reality, uh, and there are some, I think, pretty good uh, explanations rooted in evolutionary psychology, rooted in cognitive uh, uh, you know, science, if, if you will, that talk about the way in which we construct uh, entities that we experience the world, the world of the jungle, let's say, as something that is inhabited with non-humans. And whether or not these explanations capture the entirety of the experience, I kind of doubt they do, like most explanations. It does allow us to go deeper into, like, what is it about us? What is the difference between being in a situation where I'm just in a world versus being in a situation where I'm in a world that is inhabited, that has a, an other in it, that has an I-thou relationship in it. And that is a profound mystery, even in ordinary existence. I'm alone in a room. Somebody walks in. There's somebody else in the room. I'm alone in the room. I feel like somebody else is in the room. I don't see them, but I sense it. And, and I, it's uncanny. It's strange. Is it a ghost? What is that? What is that? What does it mean to sit with that? To, to work out the way that we are fundamentally relational, we're in communication with an outside world, what does it mean to sit with that and explore that without necessarily trying to resolve it into it's a real entity, it exists in another dimension, or this is just a brain fart, it's meaningless. Instead, it's actually something pointing, it's a mystery pointing to something very deep, at the very least, about us and about how persons inhabit the world of other persons so i think there are ways even there to kind of navigate this middle line uh and and to to you know celebrate it uh rather than just go okay that you know i'm in communication with these these other uh, dimensions well, as we bring things to a close for today eric in your book you speak of a failure of a massive collective transformation uh, essentially, I take this to be, you know, as the 60s moved through to the 70s and the summer of love uh, kind of died and the counterculture uh, faltered. And certainly uh, into the 80s, there was definitely a, what we could call a normality reboot, uh, you know, with Reagan's morning in America and everything went, you know, glitzy and capitalist once again. And that underwent its own series of pressures, particularly after... Uh, 9 11, I see that as a very pivotal, uh, seminal event. And then in 2012, we had this much vaunted, hoped for transformation, and of course, nothing happened. But certainly, I, I feel now that a new fragmentation is upon us. And, um, you know, the kaleidoscope pieces are definitely in flux. 
So um, we shall see what the future brings. Um, in the meantime, as mentioned, uh, your book uh, we've been discussing is entitled High Weirdness, Drugs, Esoterica and Visionary Experience in the 70s. That's available everywhere. Before we close out, perhaps you'd like to share details of your website, uh, anything you might be working on or just anything else you'd like to put out there. Sure, sure. I mean, my main website is uh, technosis.com. That's T-E-C-H-G-N-O-S-I-S. And I have, you know, decades of writing there as well as uh, um, the last, you know, four, four or five years of my 10-year going podcast. Uh, so there's lots of goodies there. And the other thing to say is that if you can get your hands on a hardback uh, high weirdness, do so because they're, they're uh, next to gone. The paperback will be out. Uh, in September, uh, along with the ebook. So if you're if that's a preferred medium, then you know hold out hold out for that. And somewhere down the line, we'll probably do an audiobook as well. I, I didn't expect to do one, but we've gotten a number of requests for it. So um, that should be a, a fun thing to do, and will uh, eventually come uh, come down the line, probably from straight directly from Strange Attractor. Splendid. Once again, Eric, thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thank you. 